Lord, we uh, give you praise, honor, and glory. And Lord, we just pray that you would uh, you move in our church, that you would move in our city and in our country, Lord, that we would have a revival for you, not a revival for issues, because the issues take care of themselves, Lord, when we love you first and we love one another. We just thank you and praise you in your name. Amen. Why don't you turn around and wave at somebody you think you might know. <laughs> oh, good morning. I want to say hello to all of you who are here in person, everyone that's tuning in online. An exciting announcement for you guys. Starting uh, next week, uh, June 14th, we will be reopening the children's ministry. Um, so I hear some excited parents. So uh, from nursery to fourth grade. Fifth grade and uh, fifth and sixth grade will still be in the service with us, and we'll be slowly reopening uh, children's ministry uh, for them in the near future. But just uh, for staffing purposes, we will be open for nursery through uh, fourth grade just on Sundays. Wednesdays, we will still all be together uh, here in the sanctuary, and then we'll reopen on Wednesdays at a later date. The youth group, so junior high and senior high, they will be kicking things off again on uh, this coming Wednesday, so June 10th. So uh, if you're in junior high or high school, just be aware of that. They're going to get things rolling again this Wednesday. So uh, drop off and pick up for uh, um, kindergarten through fourth grade will be in the breezeway. They'll have separate areas for each class to keep people kind of uh, at a safe distance. And then nursery will be at the nursery front door. But if you have any questions about that, you can see Ann Ross or talk to, to uh, anyone that seems like they have a face that tells you that they know what's going on around here. So there's two, two or three of those people here. So let's, uh, let's pray and then we'll begin. God, we humbly wait on you. Lord, we know that without you, this service is just a bunch of people going through the motions. So we ask for your spirit to move amongst us. We know, Lord, that the moment we surrendered our lives to you, we became your temple. You came and lived with, uh, tabernacled, lived within us. You gave us the gift of your Holy Spirit, your very person living within us. So, Lord, I ask this morning that you would speak through your word that you would teach us to be lights during this time in human history. A time where everything seems so chaotic, when everyone seems so confused. We know, Lord, that you will shine brightly in those lives that are willing to surrender, to humbly come before you and admit that we do not have all the answers, but you do. So teach us to love you first as you first loved us and then in turn teach us to love our neighbor. Lord, work this morning in our lives. Grow us up. Teach us what it means to be childlike. We love you and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I don't know if you guys remember, at the beginning of this year, there was a lot of talk about having 2020 vision, right? There were a lot of sermons talking about seeing things clearly for this year. It's kind of a cheesy connection with the year being 2020. Well, do we like what we see? <laughs> Many of us will say, and I, I saw a report, and who knows what if these numbers are factual and who they're actually polling for this data, data but 80% of Americans feel like things are out of control. But I wonder if God is allowing us now to see things clearly. If he's bringing things to the surface that need to be addressed. Because when you look at the flow of repentance in scripture, 
It starts with seeing our sin for what it is. And I think in this moment of chaos, if you will, we have an opportunity to take a look at our own lives and see the things that do not belong, the things that do not align with the kingdom of heaven, that do not align with someone who is truly a follower of Jesus Christ. That's where the judgment needs to begin, in the house of God. There's been a lot of blame shifting. There's been a lot of attacking. There's been a lot of arguments. But I think we need to take a step back and thank God for a little bit of clarity. Because repentance starts with seeing our sin for what it is. And we're really good at seeing sin in other people's lives. But for a moment, let's be silent before the Lord and say, God, what is my role in this? As we saw on Wednesday night, the Israelites were so quick to shift the blame of them not entering into the promised land onto anyone but themselves. But they were the ones who were unwilling to take hold of everything God had promised for them. So we asked for 2020 vision, we asked for clarity, but now that we see things a little bit more clearly, all the trust and the hope that we placed in the systems of this world, and now that those systems are in a way crumbling, all the things we've placed hope in to provide us with some type of uh, joy and contentment, and now, sorry, our sports are gone, Now we have an opportunity to say, okay, God, where am I at in my spiritual growth? Am I loving you first, and am I loving my neighbor? That's what Matthew chapter 18 is really all about. How can we remain effective in a world that is so chaotic today? As born-again believers, as followers of Jesus Christ, how can we maintain our witness? Because a lot of us are being pulled into the division that exists within this country. The arguments, the bantering, the, the backbiting, the gossip. And I think Jesus is calling us to rise above that and represent him well. And he says to do that, you must remain childlike. And that's where Pastor John laid the foundation really for this morning's study last week. As it is with all of Scripture, to divide it rightly, we have to look at it in context. To truly understand the text that's before us this morning, we have to look at that foundation that Pastor John really built from the first few verses of Matthew chapter 18. Without that foundation, what we're going to see in our minds is just a random patchwork of musings from Jesus. And that's really how we treat chapter 18. A lot of times we look at what chapter 18 contains and the only reason we join it together is because of the proximity of these themes to one another. What what do I mean by that? Well, there's a few words we think about being childlike and then there's some gruesome instruction on how we are to deal with sin in our own lives and then there's a blueprint for handling disagreements with one another And then there's some platitudes or some teachings on the importance of forgiveness. And we see them all as different thoughts, different ideas that really do not connect with one another. They're just close to one another in the Bible. And these are teachings you guys are familiar with. Okay, I get it. I'm supposed to have childlike faith. Okay, I get it. I'm supposed to cut my hand off if it causes me to sin. And I know Jesus wasn't being literal. And then I I understand how to handle disputes within the church. I'm supposed to bring my issue to my brother one-on-one, and if they reject it, then I bring a mediator, and if my brother still rejects it, then we bring it before the church, and if my brother still rejects it, then we kick him out. I, I know all that. And the forgiveness part, yeah, I remember Peter went to Jesus and said, how many times should I forgive? Seven times? And Jesus said, no, Peter, 70 times seven. Those are all things we have heard, right? 
But do we realize how intricately they are connected? Because they all deal with the same issue, remaining childlike in our humility and dependence on Jesus Christ. We are dependent on our Father for that humility, and that humility is necessary for us to go out into this world and be examples of Jesus Christ to a world that desperately needs it today. See, this is what Pastor John covered last week in Matthew 18, verse 2. Then Jesus called a little child to him. See, the disciples were having a a disagreement. After Peter, James, and John had seen Jesus transfigured on the mount, Jesus had revealed to them his eternal glory, and immediately, what are they arguing about? Hey, I'm going to be the greatest in heaven. No, I am. I'm going to sit at Jesus' right hand. No, you're not. I'm the one that Jesus loves. I'm the one that walked on water for a little bit out to Jesus. And Jesus turned to them and said, See this child, assuredly I say to you, unless you are converted and you become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. There's step one. Humility comes with conversion. Humility comes with transformation. It comes when the dead are resurrected by the power of God's Holy Spirit. I remember when I was a child, my dad's family is from a a small Amish town in Pennsylvania. And this Amish town, every Tuesday they have this giant sale, this big flea market where the whole town and surrounding towns gather. Hundreds and hundreds of people. And I remember my eyes caught a table full of toys. And I was walking with my mom and dad And I immediately went over to this table of toys. And I'm looking at all the, I mean, the toys that were there. And I turn around and I realize I don't recognize any of the faces in the crowd. And in that moment, I was desperate for one thing. And that was my mom and dad. That that was it. The toys weren't on my mind anymore. The, these uh, things called whoopie pies, they weren't on my mind anymore. The only thing I wanted was my mom and dad. That desperation is what Jesus is talking about. That kind of dependence. That's where salvation is found. It's the same desperation you see in the jailer that was responsible for keeping Paul and Silas in prison. I don't know if you recall, but it was the middle of the night. The jailer heard a loud thundering, and he went to the jail cell, and he saw the jail door swung wide open and immediately his thought was I'm a dead man so I'm going to take my life before my commanding officer does it because that's what happens in the Roman army if you lose your prisoner and as he takes his sword to take his own life Paul spoke from the jail cell he said sir don't harm yourself we are still here And the jailer turned to Paul and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Because in the time leading up to that night, Paul was preaching the gospel to this jailer. He had a captive audience. And you know he was sharing the truth of the resurrected Christ with this jailer. And then the jailer saw something in Paul that totally flipped everything on its side. Paul, what must I do to be saved? That's the cry of a desperate man. It's the same desperation that you see in the crowds. After Peter preached a Holy and Spirit gospel-fueled message, and they came to the realization that they were lost children, that they were responsible for crucifying an innocent man, not just an innocent man, the Son of God. And after Peter got done preaching this message of repentance and forgiveness through the one Jesus Christ, this was their question. Brother, what must we do? That's childlike humility. 
I don't know where to go from here. How am I to be saved? And Peter replied in Acts 2.38, Repent and be baptized, each one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. There's a lot of desperation today. And I think we're in a wonderful place. And I know it doesn't feel that way, but how many of you have grown the most when you experience the most pain in your life? You look back at that time where you were hurting and you were confused, but you turned to the Lord and the Lord brought you through it. And not only did he bring you through it, he brought you through it changed. Our nation is at a turning point right now. All of our issues that we've so delicately hit under the surface, they're coming to the top. And I think we can all agree that there are major issues. But what I don't think we will ever agree on is the solution. There's only one solution to sin. And that is the person of Jesus Christ. And the only way to get to that moment where we say, what must I do to be saved is to become like a child. I think the world is going to look for answers in human ingenuity. Jesus is too simple. What what is this man who lived 2,000 years ago, what does he have to do do with current day issues? No, we need need this change and that change and we need to look to uh, the educated and the experts. And No, it's Jesus Christ. He is the answer. But it doesn't end there either. A childlike humility begins at conversion, it begins at resurrection, but listen to what Jesus said. He said in Matthew 18, verse 4, therefore whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. It's not a one momentary act of humility, it is ongoing humility. It's humbling ourselves as children. Think back to your early years. How many of you have been saved for over 20 years? Many of you. Think back to those early years when you first came to Christ. Were you inquisitive? Were you asking questions? Were you digging into God's word because every day he was revealing something new to you about his nature and his purpose for humanity? You, you, you just couldn't get enough of God's word. Any opportunity that the church was gathering together, you needed to be there. You were a sponge for whatever God had for you. How how many of you remember that stage that your toddler was in where it was always, why? Why? Why, Dad? Why? Because. I don't know why. Why is the sky blue? Why didn't you stop at that stop sign? Why? Why? All these whys. But somewhere down the line, we go from a childlike humility and a dependence on our Father and this innocence and this hunger for Him and and His Son and His truth, and we become spiritual teenagers. No offense, teenagers. Trust me, we've all been there before. But you understand the teenage years, right? Mom and Dad suddenly know nothing. And that inquisitive innocence turns into skepticism, turns into judgment. We become dogmatic about secondary issues. We become set in our ways. We gain a little bit of knowledge and a little bit of understanding. And all of a sudden, we know it all and nobody can tell us anything. And the worst part about that is we stop listening, we stop learning, and we stop growing. 
And that's what Jesus is saying. You need to maintain that childlike humility because I have so much to teach you and you will never arrive in this life. That's what Paul is addressing in 1 Corinthians. See, the church, I love how 2,000 years ago in a completely different culture on the other side of the world, men and women are still the same. The church was arguing because there was a new hot topic to debate. And that new topic was, well, in the meat market, they sell meat after it had been sacrificed to idols. And some Christians said, it's just meat. It's cheaper. I mean, who can pass up a a sale? It's cheap meat. There's no spiritual uh, ramification for eating it. And other people were saying, no, you can't eat that meat. It's evil meat. Now, I'm not saying one was right or wrong, and that wasn't the issue, but they were becoming divided over this issue of whether or not to eat meat sacrificed to idols. And Paul writes to them in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. He says, now concerning things offered to idols. And I'm sure when the church was reading this letter, each side was thinking, okay, here we go. Paul's going to have the final word. He's going to side with us. But he doesn't take a side. He runs for the cross. And he runs to love. He says, now concerning things offered to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. But knowledge puffs up. Love edifies. And if anyone thinks that he knows anything, he knows nothing yet as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, this one is known by him. We live in a generation that is all about taking a side. The sides are frameworked for us. It's like two boxes are created, box A and box B, and you better get in a box or you're going to be wrong. Guys, we don't have to get in either of those boxes. Life is far more complex than that. The only side that we need to be on is the side of Jesus Christ and his holy word. So that's the foundation, that's the context of what Jesus is addressing in Matthew 18. He says, I want you to maintain childlike humility. You guys are arguing over who is the greatest. That is not how a citizen of the kingdom of heaven behaves. That's worldly behavior. No, a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, a child of God, All they want to do is stay at the side of their Father in heaven and learn from him. And I'm going to teach you how to do that. And that's where we are in verse 8. I want you to notice something. To remain humble, you're going to see this reoccurring theme. For us to remain humble individually, we need one another. That's the continuing theme you're going to hear. For us to remain in that childlike state of dependence and humility and innocence and longing for more of Jesus in my life, we need one another to achieve that work. Look at Matthew chapter 18, verse 8. If your hand or foot causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. It is better for you to enter into life lame or maimed rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into the everlasting fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. It is better for you to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. Okay, Jesus is using some harsh hyperbole here. And we can all agree it's hyperbole, right? Or else we would have no hands and no eyes. Can we agree on that? But it doesn't negate the strength at which Jesus' words are to be taken. He obviously feels very seriously about this issue. Now, this isn't just about personal righteousness. This isn't just about being personally holy. This follows Jesus', again, hyperbole, but heavy words about causing a small one or a child to sin. Remember, he said it would be better if a millstone was tied around our neck 
And again, as Pastor John said, a millstone was a, a huge, heavy stone that was used by oxen to grind stone or grind grain into dust. Massive. And Jesus said it'd be better if that stone was tied around your neck and you were tossed into the sea than to cause one of these little ones to stumble. And to stumble, that means to lead them off course, to lead them, lead them in a direction other than the path God has prepared for them. And as Pastor John said, little ones definitely includes children, but remember, you must be converted as a little child. So Jesus is referring to new believers, young men and women in the faith. And he is deeply concerned that we are an example to young believers in how to live and love like Jesus Christ. Our personal pursuit of righteousness isn't only personal, and a lot of times we feel that way. We have a very individualistic view of our faith. And we need to understand that we live in a very individualistic culture. So we live in a culture that reinforces that desire to only look out for number one. And we can apply that to our own study of God's word. Even this morning, we're probably listening in a way that is just kind of shaped about, okay, how can I become a better individual? And we're not seeing that we're part of a bigger community. Our holiness... Our sanctification, if you will, our spiritual growth, becoming more and more like Jesus, it's not just about us. It's for the good of our Christian community. Look around and see these faces. Some of you did, some of you didn't, but that's fine. You know who's in here. Even if you're watching online, you you know who's part of this family. Do we consider that our personal walk and what we allow into our lives and the sin, the habitual sin that we partake in, do we realize that we are hurting one another? That we are leading this body off course? That when we are in sin, we are holding back the gifts God has given us to edify this group right here and the church the larger church as a whole. There are people who are radically, all of you guys are radically gifted. God has equipped you in some unique way to better this community of believers. Every single one of you. If you've given your life to Jesus Christ, you are a gifted individual. But how many have been disqualified because they didn't cut off their hand and they didn't pluck out their eye? They didn't get rid of that sin, and right now they are in bondage, and we are missing out on their gift. When we neglect our relationship with Jesus, it harms the whole body. When we embrace repeated habitual sin, we are steering the body off course. It's not just about us. We do not sin on an island. Now again, we know Jesus is using hyperbole but he's using it for a reason. He loves his church. And when we harm the church, we harm him. Listen to what Jesus says in Matthew 25, verse 41. He's talking about this time of separation, this time where he will be separating the goats from the sheep, those who have trusted on him for salvation and those who have rejected him. And he says that during that time, Matthew 25, 41, then he will also say to those on the left hand, depart from me, you cursed into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not take me in. Naked and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, you did not visit me. Then they will also answer him saying, Lord, when did this happen? When did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and we didn't minister to you? And Jesus will answer them saying, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch you did not do it to one of the least of these, You did not do it to me. 
Oftentimes we think about sin as something that we do. We rarely think about sin as something that we do not do. A sin of omission, if you will. But that's exactly what Jesus is saying. We can cause a brother or sister to stumble when we neglect them. When we see them in need and we don't do everything that God has empowered us to do to meet that need, we rarely think about all the opportunities God puts in front of us to build up the body that we pass on. But those are the very things that Jesus draws our attention to. He says to humble ourselves as children, we must put away our old behaviors. And part of that old behavior is looking out for number one. Part of that old behavior is seeking and serving our own needs above the needs of one another. When scripture says, put the needs of others above ourselves. You know, there's a lot of men and women that have a lot of opinions. But there are not a lot of men and women who are men and women of action. And I know that that's what God is calling the church to be. Guys, opinions are a dime a dozen. And now we have this wonderful platform to share it with the world. Facebook, social media. And again, this is to me. This isn't to you. This is to me. But we can talk all we want about how the riots and the destruction is offensive to us. But how many of us were downtown helping those store owners clean up their shops? Because it can offend us, but not enough to get us out of our seat, right? Let's be more than men and women of opinion. Let's be men and women of action. I was hungry. I was thirsty. I was naked. I was sick. I was imprisoned. And you did nothing. Jesus is calling the church to be more than that. So for one, it starts with looking in the mirror, seeing our sins, our sins of commission and omission, the things we are doing and the things that we aren't doing that do not align with a follower of Jesus Christ, and then saying, Jesus, deal with those things. Cut it out. I don't want any part of it. It starts with seeing ourselves for who we are. That's a good place to be because we know a loving father never says, okay, you know, I I forgave your sins, but I didn't know they were this bad. God never says that. He says, thank you. You finally realize how bad things are. And now I can work in your life. Because that's what I sent my son to do. That's what I sent my spirit to do. Second, dealing with personal sin and then sharing the heart of our Father. There's a lot of biblical imperatives or biblical commands or instructions or whatever you want to call it. A lot of people view God's word as just a list of rules, and that's not it at all. But there is instruction for godly living. But we need to understand the flow of Scripture when we look at instruction, because if we don't, we'll think it's just a set of rules. This is what we see, especially in Paul's epistles. Before he ever gives a commandment, well, let me back up a little. This is how he frames it. Paul tells us what we must do. And then he tells us why we can't do it. Why in the flesh we're not able to, to do what God is calling us to do. Then he tells us how Jesus accomplished it and then how we can do it through Christ. That's the flow of biblical instruction. We always run run to how we're supposed to do it and then we try to do it in the flesh and we leave ourselves just completely worn out and disappointed. But Paul says, this is what you must do, but you're evil so you can't do it. This is how Jesus did it. And now this is how you can do it through him. God, love the Lord your God because he first loved you. So, so I, I, I say all of that as we approach Matthew 18, verse 10. Take heed that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I say to you 
that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. For the Son of Man has come to save that which is lost. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them goes astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine and go to the mountains to seek the one that is straying? And if he should find it, assuredly I say to you, he rejoices more over that sheep than over the ninety-nine that did not go astray. Even so, it is not the will of your Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. So again, in the context of remaining humble like a child, part of that is going where our Father goes and doing what our Father does. Loving the lost is impossible in the flesh. Reaching out to a dying world that desperately needs Jesus and putting their needs above our own is impossible in the flesh. We know we're supposed to do it, but often we just don't know how. But to humble ourselves like a child We have to understand the heart of our Father and that it's Jesus who came to seek and save the lost. That it's Jesus who came to restore what is broken, to redeem what has been forfeited, and to resurrect what has been lost to the grave. And our responsibility as a child is to follow in our Father's footsteps and remain dependent on Him, never leaving His side, going where He goes and doing what He does. It's not about us loving the world and sharing the gospel. It's about the Lord loving the world through us. He is looking for those who are willing, not those who are able. He'll empower those who are willing. When we spend time with Jesus, and we've covered this so many times as we studied the Gospels, when we spend time with Jesus, we will become like Jesus and we'll begin to do what he did. We can't jump to obedience without sitting at the feet of Jesus Christ. And as we sit at his feet, this is this amazing transformation that takes place. What breaks his heart will start to break our hearts. And what he finds joy in, we'll start to find joy in. Right now, we are a church distracted. The American church has lost focus. And we have lost focus because we've taken our eyes off, the, off of Jesus and we're looking at our circumstances. And I don't know about you, it's been a roller coaster, hasn't it? Some nights I'm thinking, man, we're all going to die. And the next morning, I'm like, no, God's moving. God's good. He's working through this. And then 10 minutes later, I read Facebook, and I'm like, we're all going to (laughs) die. But we need to shift our focus from the problems onto the solution. And we need to find ourselves more often than not learning from our teacher, our rabbi, our king, because as we spend time with him, as we spend time doing things like this, as we spend time with our families, looking at God's word, talking about God's word, setting our minds upon God's word, we're going to find that our heart's going to start to break. We're not going to be as bitter and vengeful at this fallen world. Our heart is simply going to break for it, and we'll just want to go out and get that one who is lost and bring him back to the fold. And when we do, our heart rejoices. Matthew 18, 13. And if he should find it, assuredly, I say to you, he rejoices more over that sheep than over the 99 that did not go astray. And that's not only the loss of the world, that's when members of our church family wander. Have we lost sight of the purpose of the church? Have we lost our excitement for the purpose and plans of Jesus Christ in this world? Is what happens when we gather together like this still worth it? Is it worth the effort? Is it worth the added risk? Here, and again, hear me out on this, because I need to be very careful how I frame this. Because there are people staying home from church because they are uniquely at risk because of this new novel virus that has entered the scene. 
But my prayer and my concern is that we never become comfortable with being apart. That we never get to a place where it's more comfortable just to turn on the TV and watch a church service and then never return. Because we have been conditioned to start before COVID-19 ever hit. We as Americans were being conditioned to be comfortable with being isolated. For many, what did their days look like? You get up, you brush your teeth, you eat breakfast, get your cup of coffee, you go to work. After work, you come home, you watch Netflix for a little bit, and you go to bed. And then you rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat. So that when this quarantine took place, everyone's just like, okay, <laughs> that's kind of my normal life anyway. Now, don't get me wrong. Again, I'm, I want to make sure I'm framing this correctly. There obviously is a time to stay home and stay safe. So no one tuning in online, I want to feel guilty about that at all. But we need to be careful that we don't become conditioned and think that this, coming together, leaning on one another, sharing each other's burdens, supporting one another, I have watched firsthand as people in our fellowship have struggled in their marriages, with addictions. See, sin continues. Our sin nature continues even when the world is on pause. And over the last two months, there have been many people within our flock who have been struggling why? Because we were created to be with one another. So again, I say all of that just so that we would be cautious. That we wouldn't allow ourselves to forsake the fellowship simply out of fear. People are still lost. Christian, people are still lost. Christians are still wandering. And there is still work to be done. And God is still moving. So, again, all of this can sound like really high-minded ideals without practicality. How are we supposed to seek out the lost? How are we to follow in the footsteps of our Father? Well, Jesus tells us. He doesn't leave us hanging. Look at Matthew 18, verse 15. Moreover, if your brother sins against you, and here we are, living in fellowship, living in community, God is working in each one of us, but guess what? We still have that old nature, and eventually we are going to sin against one another, but I have to preface this section of scripture with this. Guys, this isn't about being a sin sniffer. This isn't about looking around for someone to slip up and then jumping on him and saying, hey, Matthew 18, you messed up. Get it together. Guys, this is about repeat habitual sin in a brother or sister's life. Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault. Between you and him alone, if he hears you, you have gained your brother. The lost has been found. You see restoration. Verse 16, but if he will not hear, take with you one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. And if he still refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuses even to hear the church, let him, to be, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. Assuredly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. Now, how many of you have heard that verse, but it's usually taken out of context? We come together for worship or prayer, and Lord, where two or more gathered, you are there. Well, what if you're by yourself? God, you're not here yet. Let me phone a friend. Because once they get here, you'll be with. No, that's obviously not what God's saying. This verse has to be looked at in context. It's a verse about restoration. 
It's a verse about the heart of God, what his will is. His will is for restoring broken relationships within the body of Christ. So we know how to handle our own sin. When we look in the mirror and we see something that does not belong, we shouldn't run from the mirror forgetting what manner of man or woman we are. We should deal with the sin that is in front of us and place it at the feet of Jesus and work through it. But how do we handle the sin of a brother or sister? How do we handle the sin of someone who repeatedly offends us, hurts us? And how do, we lo- how do we help that lost sheep who has found themselves outside the provision of the prote- and the protection of the shepherd come back home? And it starts with the first step that I think sometimes we barely ever make it to. When someone hurts us, what do we normally do? When someone of- offends us, what is our gut reaction? Do we go to them in humility and say, you know what, this is an issue. You're harming me, you're harming the body of Christ. With biblical precedence, this isn't, again guys, this isn't about preference. You wore a hat to church, and I'm sorry, but that is sin. That's not what we're talking about. The drums are too loud, brother. Dad, quiet, my dad's the drummer, so that's not talking about preference. We're not talking about the color of carpet. We're not talking about uh, tattoos. We're not talking about all these secondary issues. We are talking about exampling the person of Jesus Christ and someone who finds themselves in habitual sin. And we are told to go to them one-on-one, not gossip about it, not call a friend so we can get them on our side, not... Deal with it by telling everyone else but the person affected. We are told to go to that individual in humility and seek restoration. That's what it means to be childlike. I remember Isaiah, my youngest son, well, not my youngest son anymore, but my youngest son 10 months ago. um, He came home from school and he was heartbroken because he and his friend had gotten in a fight. And it was a misunderstanding. But he was just, he was beside himself. And so I gave him some really wise counsel on how to handle it. And, and the next day he came home from school and I said, hey, how did things go? And he's like, how, how did what go? And I said, you know, that argument that you were in, did you say all the things that I told you to say? Oh, no, we forgot about it. We're good. Uh, Okay. As a child, they're not looking for restitution. They just want reconciliation. They are so quick to forgive and move on. And I think if we are just willing to take step one, the church would be so much healthier. Because childlike humility isn't eager to drag someone's private struggles into the public eye. We want to see healing in one another's lives. As Paul writes in Galatians chapter 6, verse 1, If a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. Considering that you and these are kind of his words summed up, that you could be in the same position at any moment in time. Who do you think you are? Considering yourself. Paul is just restating what Jesus taught us and removing the plank from our own eye before we go to remove the speck from a brother's eye. So again, guys, I don't want to belabor this point, but this is something we have to get right if we are going to remain childlike as a community of believers. We need to seek restoration above restitution. And that takes a great deal of prayer before that tough conversation. And it takes a great deal of humility and self-reflection. But after all of that, eventually we have to have that uncomfortable conversation. And we don't like that conversation. It's always easier to have that conversation with a friend who will agree with us or a friend who will take our side or a friend who will say, man, you're right. What was that person thinking? 
But guys, we have to have that tough conversation. When we see true habitual sin, we have to trust that the same Spirit of God that's working within us is also working within them. And the reality is, and I've seen this many times, when we reach out in love and we say, hey, can, can I spend some time with you? Can I talk to you? And we sit down and we share what God has put on our heart. The, God, the Lord has already been working on their heart. And a lot of times there's a lot of tears. And that individual says, you know what? I know it's been a battle for me. Thank you for loving me enough. To share that with me. And that can be a powerful mo moment. And it can lead to repentance. But guess what? That's not always the case, is it? Sometimes we'll go to a brother or a sister and they'll reject what we have to share with them. And then we're told what to do. We're to bring an impartial witness. An impartial witness. And then we go with that witness when with a biblical precedent, we share the truth of God's word. And if they still reject it, then we bring it before church leadership. And if they still reject it, then we say, okay, you want to live the life of an unbeliever? Do that. But your lifestyle is confusing the image of Jesus Christ. It's projecting the wrong story to the world. And that can't exist within our body. And this isn't about shame. This isn't about embarrassment. It's not because we don't love you, but we need to allow you to follow that sin's path all the way to its logical conclusion. And that logical conclusion is death. And if you're unwilling to turn from it, you need to go and live it, just not in the context of Christ's body. Because it doesn't belong in God, Christ's body. And then once you see that everything God's word says is true, then come back and be restored. But obviously you won't hear a brother, you won't hear a group of brothers, you won't hear the church leadership. You're going to do what you want to do, go and do it. Not because we don't love you, but because that needs to be your teacher. Paul gave the same instruction to the church in Corinth when they had embraced a brother who was sleeping with his stepmother. And Paul said, you have embraced this man, let him Go out into the world, send him out so that his sin may give birth to death and he can reap the natural consequences of his behaviors. Guys, these aren't suggestions. This is the roadmap that Jesus has given us. Okay, let's close here with this last section. Christ-like humility, childlike humility is seeing our sin for what it is. It's leaning on one, one another. It's restoring the lost. It's restoring the broken in a spirit of humility. It's not being so scared to speak up because we want to be a people pleaser, but it's having those co tough conversations out of love to restore one another. And finally, this is it. This is the core of childlike humility, forgiveness. Finally, Jesus closes in Matthew 18, 21, then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? You guys ever ask a question, but you're not asking a question at all, you're making a statement? You see that a lot on, I hate bringing this place up in Facebook, right? Oh, let me ask this question. No, that's not a question, that's a statement. That's what Peter's doing here. See, Peter, throughout Jesus' teaching, has placed himself in the role as the offendee. He's been hearing Jesus' teaching, and been, he's been thinking to himself, okay, I'll be the one that's doing the forgiving. I'll be the one that's doing the restoring. I'm the spiritual brother. So automatically by his question, he's trying to say, Jesus, I've got you figured out. I get where you're going here. See, the Pharisees, they said, you must forgive your brother two times. 
and maybe if you're super spiritual, three times. So Peter came to Jesus and he thought he was one-upping the Pharisees because Jesus says your righteousness needs to exceed that of the Pharisees. And Peter said, we have to forgive seven times on Jesus. Now, if we're like Peter, if we're certain we will be the one restoring a brother, if we're certain we're going to be the one offering forgiveness, let me remind you that it was Peter who had to be restored after denying Christ and cursing Christ three times. Peter was so confident in his righteousness, but he was the one having to be restored. And think about that even after the Holy Spirit came and Peter one of the pillars of the early church was operating and he was eating with the Gentiles and exampling a heart of acceptance because every tongue every tribe every nation was gathered into a right relationship with Jesus Christ the Gentiles were now folded into that right relationship if you recall, the Judaizers, or the Jewish, I'm sorry, the Jewish born-again believers came down from Jerusalem, and when they showed up, Peter was embarrassed of the Gentiles, and Paul had to follow through exactly on what Jesus said. He had to pull Peter aside and said, Peter, you're not exampling the gospel. The gospel is for every tribe, every tongue, every nation, and when the Jewish Christians showed up, you showed partiality. That was wrong. So before we think we have it all figured out, let us understand that someday we will need to be restored. Will we re remain humble when that happens? Matthew 18, verse 22. Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. How much is that? We just guess. But let me tell you this. A talent is the largest unit of currency in the Roman Empire. And 10,000 is the highest Greek numeral. So in this parable, Jesus is saying the biggest number you can think of, that's how much this guy owed. But as he was not able to pay, his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and that payment be made. The servant therefore fell down before him saying, Master, have patience with me. I will pay you all. Then the master of that servant was moved with compassion and released him. And forgave all of his debt. But that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. Guys, that's one sixteen hundredth of his debt. Just a small fraction of what he owed. So that servant went out and found someone who owed him almost nothing. Seventeen dollars. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat saying, pay me what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, Have patience with me, I will pay you all. And he would not, but went and threw him in prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what, he had been, what had been done, they were very grieved and came and told their master all that had been done. Then his master, after he called him, said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have compassion on your fellow servant, just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due him. So my heavenly Father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. So in short, Jesus tells Peter, oh, it's not seven times. I just want you to forgive to the extent that you have been forgiven. That's all. I just want you to forgive others to the same extent that you have been forgiven, which is everything. If God has canceled out our immense debt through Jesus, who are we to hold back any forgiveness from anyone else? 
bitterness, resentment. It doesn't represent kingdom behavior. It doesn't represent the heart of Christ, and it doesn't reflect childlike humility. We can spend all morning on forgiveness, but we need to close. Let's have the worship team come forward. So again, I want to close with this observation. We need one another to remain childlike. Everything that Jesus has taught us here assumes that we are together, assumes that we are working things out with one another. And sometimes it's a little bit messy. Sometimes it's a lot messy. But an emergency room seems kind of chaotic, doesn't it? But there's healing taking place. Let's be very careful again not to give up something as vital as gathering together. And when we do get together, let's make our time together worth it. If we have sin in our lives that need to be dealt with, let's deal with them because it's impacting the entire body of Christ. If God has put someone on our heart that is lost, reach out to them in love and in humility and invite them back into the fold. If we're harboring bitterness this morning, understand that that is not kingdom behavior. It's not easy to forgive. But again, when Jesus gives us direction, he's not telling us to do it in the flesh. And if you can say this morning, I can't forgive. This person has harmed me too deeply. That's fine. As long as you can say, but I understand Jesus is calling me to something more. And Lord, I need you to do that work in me, to bring me to a place where I can truly forgive. Because that's a prayer that I know God will honor. So as we share in communion, you guys already have your cups. If you don't have a cup, we did, we're not passing around the trays. But if you need a cup, raise your hand. They're fancy this morning. You just peel off the top. That cracker's underneath. And the juice is below. Raise your hand if you need a cup. Let's reflect. I know a lot of times we'll do somber songs, reflective songs during communion. But this morning, I think it's really cool. We're going to do something a little bit more um, praiseful, if you will. Because we are going to celebrate the reality that wherever two or more are gathered, Jesus is there. And there's healing and there's restoration. So for those of you who are harboring bitterness, Jesus can deal with that. For those of you harboring hidden sin, Jesus wants to deal with that. And we're going to celebrate that reality. But before we do, I'm just going to ask you to bow your heads, close your eyes. If you're watching online, do the same. No peeking. If you're harboring sit, hidden sin and you're ready to be done with it and you just need a brother to pray with you, I'd be honored to be that man. If that's you and you're ready to turn from it and leave it at the cross of Christ, I'd be honored to pray with you this morning if you'd raise your hand. Anybody at all, praise God, praise God. Remember, it's not just sins of commission, it's the things that we're avoiding, it's the things we're not doing that Christ is calling us to. If that's you, if you'd raise your hand, I'd be honored to pray with you. Praise God, praise God, praise God. Are any of you harboring bitterness? The Lord's calling you to forgive and you're just not there yet, but you want the Lord to work. You want to really learn the breadth and the width of his forgiveness for you so that you can turn around and forgive someone else. If that's you, would you raise your hand? Praise God. Lord, we are so grateful that you are so patient with us, but we do not want to be idle as your church. Help us, Lord, to have that childlike innocence and dependence, dependence on you. Bring us back to a place where we are just asking all kinds of questions because we want to know you more. For those who want to turn from their sin this morning, Lord, we know that you are faithful to forgive and you cast that sin as far as the east is from the west. And you don't shun that 
son or daughter, but you tell them, just come closer. I knew about it all along. I was just waiting for you to acknowledge it. And for those of us that need help forgiving, Lord, help us to see the cross. And Lord, as we share communion, help this song to be a shout of praise because we've been delivered, we are free. And we are free now to love one another.